Let's get into it. Soul Not For Sale podcast. We got Joe Rogan talking about a gentleman who was testifying against Boeing and ended up not being alive anymore. That's just a coincidence, I'm sure. But instead of just assuming it's a coincidence, because we're all good hearted people, we're going to roll through the events that have taken place with, and I don't want to mispronounce his name, I believe his name is Josh Barnett, sorry, John Barnett. So let's look into that. Joe Rogan's going to be talking about it with James Lindsay. They also touch on DEI hiring in the aviation industry, which is just running rampant. I'm going to show you some examples of that. And James Lindsay actually has a wild theory, maybe not so wild, about what's going on with Boeing and it has to do with China. This is a theory that I've not heard before. Very interesting. Joe has his tinfoil hat on. James has his tinfoil hat on. I have my tinfoil speedo on. Let's get started. Let's get started right now. I got about 10 or 11 clips for you. You're going to be hearing from Tucker Carlson, Matt Walsh as well, Elon Musk, brief chime in. Two people are very mad at Elon Musk for what he said about DEI. And, uh, Let's get going. Don't forget about IamCoachColin.com. We got Soul Not For Sale stuff. We got Cancel Hollywood stuff. Stop Worshipping Celebrities. Public Enemy Number One. Anti-Mainstream stuff. The discount code is IamCoachColin. All capital letters, all one word. One L in the name Colin. Let's get into this clip. Wild. Totally. It's, it's so wild to see. It's just very strange. And it's very... Here's what drives me crazy. Like, how is, how is all this... Uh, DEI stuff getting into airplanes like yeah isn't that scary as hell you not isn't United run by a drag queen well he the guy who likes that, to do drag one, you know, Scott Kirby's the guy's name um which sucks because I fly on United a lot and, <laughs> uh, yeah and um but don't you want like the absolute best people regardless of their sexual orientation their gender their color their race the very best people that you can get to fly the fucking planes yeah I do and fix the fucking planes wouldn't you like I'd like it'd be sweet if we had the best people for the job you want to put the tinfoil hat back on I got an explanation okay okay so earlier I said that the goal is to degrow the West and facilitate China's rise Okay, so what's happening? Boeing 737, Boeing 737, Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. We see all this DEI stuff at Boeing. We see all these problems. We just see this guy that committed suicide. That the, was whistleblower. the whistleblower yeah. against Boeing who was saying some deep stuff like that they were intentionally fitting bogus parts. I don't know if this is true, but this is what he was alleging. And then all of a sudden he you know, decided it was a good day to kill himself right before his deposition he was supposed to go to. And so, I mean, it's weird timing. But what's going? he's saying that, that, that Boeing – could be construed, let's suggest, as though it's deliberately committing suicide as an organization. It's cutting corners. It's locked in by this ESG, DEI stuff. That's it. The easy question is why is DEI? Because ESG. It's the S and ESG. But little do most Americans realize, in addition to scaring the hell out of people and getting people to fly less, China just released a new jet like two years ago called the Comac C919 that is a direct competitor to the Boeing 737. So maybe you kill Boeing and you allow American manufacturing of high quality aircraft to fall and then the Chinese competitor is now the thing on the market that doesn't have this bad rap sheet and this risk factor. Maybe it's big, dirty international business that's actually happening. Nobody knows about the COMAC because what do we, how much do we pay attention to Chinese stuff? They literally, it launched last year for commercial production. That seems like such a hat you're wearing made I know. of tinfoil. I know, that but the one. problem but, but is you... that's how ESG works. The degrowth strategy of the West and the trap. Right, but someone at Boeing must know this is going on, and why would they ever allow that to happen if they're a corporation? Well, and they have if, shareholders. And, oh, but we're exiting shareholder capitalism for stakeholder capitalism now. In other words, to answer to the ESG uh, cartel, they are. I mean, the Harvard document, this Harvard corporate law document that I was talking about earlier, explicitly says that your governance score can go up for giving yourself corporate bonuses for installing ESG. So you're the CEO, you're the C-suite of of Boeing, and you're like, well, my business is going to get attacked on the market. It's going to be hard to get capital lines of capital through these banks unless I'm ESG compliant, and I get a gigantic bonus if I'm ESG compliant. Well, let's just be ESG compliant. ESG compliant starts telling you you have all of these expensive regulations that you have to go through, and you have all of these um, DEI social justice things you have to install, all these uh, administrators you have to hire, commissars you have to hire, DEI officers, ESG officers. Those are like six, seven-figure jobs. 
you see, you have all this stuff. So what is it to cut corners on the cost a little bit to pull a broken piece out of the scrap and screw it onto the back of an airplane or to hire uh, people who are not really like they don't know what an impact wrench is, but they'll figure it out on the, on, you know, the tail portion of a 737 in a moment. Um, so you hear the left saying it's corporate corner cutting, it's corporate corner cutting, that's profits over everything. Well, what if the market that they're running in is actually controlled in this ESG sense to where they have very few options and they get to reward themselves for installing it and are punished if they don't. And I will wear this. I'm, I will put the biggest, let, let's fold a tricorn revolutionary war tinfoil hat and go, Joe. Let's yeah, go. that's what I'm looking at now. I'm looking at one of them sailboat looking. Things. Hell yes. Yeah. But that would mean they're intentionally destroying a company by sabotage and by a slow infiltration of these ideas to the point where you can get them to fit inferior parts on an aircraft that doesn't it seems like there's got to be inspectors right so well, the that's, inspectors that's must part be of the watching. scandal is that that's what this guy that what is he suicide. saying that's what he was saying is that they're they were not inspecting correctly and then part of the video that went viral of him talking was that him and his team went out there and they inspected and they found all these violations let's see his video let's see his video because I, i've only seen him speak very briefly but i saw the story and i was like jesus christ yeah and I, my first initial thought was this man was so embarrassed by the fact that he incorrectly said that Boeing was an evil corporation that he decided to take his own life because he knew that Boeing was amazing and that uh, he had generally, genuinely done a terrible thing, so he decided to take his life. Yeah, that's a plausible That seems most likely. Yeah. Because the other the other possibilities that killed him yeah, because that's, uh, he's telling the truth. Yeah, that was going to be a problem. That's a dark story right there. That's The dark story is that they killed him because if he's dead, then they make billions of dollars. And if he's alive, he could fuck them up and cause the stock to crash yeah. and all kinds of other problems to happen and a lot of investigations and all kinds of other stuff, if he's right. Have you heard of this thing, degrowth, by the way? No, I haven't. Um, do we have that video of that? I want to hear it, though. I want to hear about this degrowth thing because this is also 4D chess that scares the shit out of me. It scares the shit out of me to think that there really is a puppet master. Well, or there's group. A, yeah, a committee, probably. Yeah, but the, council. The, Soviet means council. Yeah. But th that it's actually effective. But then if you think about who the actual president is, you know he's not in charge. So, well, who is it then? So, uh, like, we've agreed mm -hmm. to let a bunch of people that we're not exactly sure who they are run the country. And once you get that sort of a system in place, they'll do whatever the fuck they can to make sure that they keep that. Well, because they can just do. keep him in there alive for four more years. <laughs> he's going to be even crazier three years from now. People should look up the Council for Inclusive Capitalism while they're, at, while they're wearing their tinfoil hats. I almost want him to be president for three more years just for stand-up. Well, there is that. I mean, I don't know how much longer he can go. Yeah, there's, there he is. There, yeah, so let's listen to this guy. One, this is not a 737 problem. It's a Boeing problem. Um, and I know the FAA has gone in and they've done due diligence and inspections to assure that the door plugs of the 737 are, are installed properly and the fasteners are stored properly. But my concern is what's the rest of the airplane? What's the rest of the condition of the airplane? And the reason my concern for that is back in 2012, Boeing started removing inspection operations off their jobs. So it left the mechanics to buy off their own work. So what we're seeing with the door plug blowout is what I've seen with the rest of the airplane as far as jobs not being completed properly, inspection of steps being removed, um, issues being ignored. My concerns are with the 737 and the 787 because those programs have really embraced the theory that quality is overhead and non-value added. Um, so those two programs have really put a strong effort into removing quality from the process. When I first started working at Charleston, I was in charge with pushing back defects to our suppliers. And what that meant was I'd take a group of inspectors and actually go to the supplier and inspect their product before they sent it in. Well, I'd taken a team of four inspectors to Spirit Aerosystems to inspect the 41 section before they sent it to Charleston. And we found 300 defects. Some of them were significant that needed engineering um, intervention. Um, when I returned to Charleston, my senior manager told me that we had found too many defects and he was gonna take the next trip. So the next trip he went on, he took two of my inspectors. And when they got back, they were given accolades for only finding 50 defects. So I pulled that inspector aside and I said, did Spirit really clean up their act that quick? That well, that sounds like a money thing, right? They're saying that quality is overhead. They're yeah, well, at, that's his profits. First, uh, whistleblower statement was made in 2017, I think. Mm. Yeah, he was what doing like a deposition or something the other day when he was found dead in his car in the parking lot of a hotel. Um, so, but you said the profit thing. Damn. There. So I mentioned the Comac 
C919, and that's the direct competitor, Chinese manufacturer, or new Chinese manufacturer to the 737. Well, there's a Comac 929 as well, which is a direct competitor to the 777 and 787. And the 787 is the other one that he just mentioned. And so, um, so direct competitor, you know, China is trying to step into the arena and be the top, you know, jet seller. I don't know. Uh, I guess that's what he's saying. Manufacturer, I guess. Now, I just want to bring in the fact that I cut off the clip of that gentleman talking because I wanted to do him a little more respect. If you're asking, uh, if you're thinking, hey, why didn't you show the guy's face? Well, it's because Joe wasn't showing the guy's face. For some reason, they had this botched view of half the guy's face. And I just want you guys to actually be able to see him because this man did what most truthers claim that they are willing to do. And um, it costs him his life. He stood up, he spoke, he would not back down, and something ended up happening to him. And I'm going to be showing you a series of clips now to kind of get to the bottom of it. Not fully, I know what I think, but I'll show you as much as I can so you can understand and you can come to your own conclusion but let's play the actual clip and see this guy actually talking about it himself one this is not a 737 problem it's a Boeing problem um and i know the faa's gone in and they've done due diligence and inspections to assure that the door plugs of the 737 are are installed properly and the fasteners are torqued properly but my concern is what's the rest of the airplane what's the rest of the condition of the airplane and the reason my concern for that is Back in 2012, Boeing started removing inspection operations off their jobs. So it left the mechanics to buy off their own work. So what we're seeing with the door plug blowout is what I've seen with the rest of the airplane as far as jobs not being completed properly, inspection steps being removed, um, issues being ignored my concerns are with the 737 and the 787 because those programs have really embraced the theory that quality is overhead and non-value added um, so those two programs have really put a strong effort into removing quality from the process when i first started working at charleston i was in charge with pushing back defects to our suppliers and what that meant was I'd take a group of inspectors and actually go to the supplier and inspect their product before they sent it in. Well, I'd taken a team of four inspectors to Spirit Aerosystems to inspect the 41 section before they sent it to Charleston. And we found 300 defects. Some of them were significant that needed engineering um, intervention. Um, when I returned to Charleston, my senior manager told me that we had found too many defects and he was gonna take the next trip. So the next trip he went on, he took two of my inspectors. And when they got back, they were given accolades for only finding 50 defects. So I pulled that inspector aside and I said, did Spirit really clean up their act that quick? That don't sound right. And she was mad. She said, no, said the two inspectors were given two hours to inspect the whole 41 section and they were kicked off the airplane. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, this is what he said before passing, but not just before passing. It's not like he said this and then he was gone. He actually uh, was testifying. He, well, I'll just sum it up. He wrapped up a little early and then went back to his hotel room. And, you know, we'll explore the rest of these clips now. Now, just to talk about what Joe and James were talking about, this really goes under why would this happen? You know, I think it goes along with Agenda 2030. You know, I'll never forget the article. The World Economic Forum has buried the article. It's very hard to find any even just crumbs of it. But I remember perfectly that they said that the U.S. would no longer be a superpower and there would be a handful of superpowers. And in order for that to happen, you can't just go to the U.S. and be like, can you no longer be a superpower, please? All these other people want to play as well. You cannot do that. You have to slowly erode the society, the government, the military, everything. Everything has to slowly erode and be so unstable and be being attacked not just from the outside but from the inside as well 
so the action so the u.s can't be a superpower anymore and i think that's part of it i think that might be part of it because why would you do that why would you have such shoddy things going on now there's another theory that i'll bring up as we start exploring the world of dei and what that looks like and some terrible things that have happened again tucker carlson has a horrible story of dei in play in the absolute worst way now Agenda 2030, the U.S. not being a superpower anymore, intentional erosion of the U.S. Uh, kind of goes in line again with Larry Fink's quote of we have to force behavior. We have to force certain things in certain companies. I don't know. When I look at what Bud Light did, I see a company that was more concerned about ESG and what they looked like there because maybe they need to borrow a billion dollars, six billion dollars. And if they don't do that to one of their top shareholders, which is BlackRock, which is run by Larry Fink, the man who said we have to force behaviors, then if they don't get in line, then there's gonna be consequences. This is exactly what Larry Fink said. There'll be consequences. It will impact you financially if you do not accept the behaviors that we're trying to force on the company and as a result onto the people who are the end users of whatever product, whether it be Target, whether it be Doritos, whether it be, you know? So that's just that's just what I'm thinking right there. It just reeks of that. Now, let's explore a little more. You just heard John talking before he passed away. Now we're gonna be hearing a little bit afterwards, and these ladies are gonna be breaking down some of the things that happened in his case and talking about whether this is something that he did himself or not. And uh, yeah, let's get into that. Really specifically want to drill into this last story that Kelsey mentioned about this whistleblower, John Barnett, found dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound, according to police. He was right in the middle of providing testimony on this major lawsuit against Boeing. And now a close family friend is telling a Charleston TV station that he told her if anything ever happened to him, quote, it is not suicide. What are your thoughts on this case? Well, first of all, uh, my condolences to his family. Second of all, certainly law enforcement is going to have to look long and hard at the circumstances, but this is what we know so far. We know that a silver pistol was found in his hand. One of the first things I wanna know is, was it his dominant hand? This is always a clear indication whether it was self-inflicted or not. Secondly, we know there was a note in the other hand. What exactly did that note say? We also know he was under a lot of stress and in fact had been testifying and they had to stop that testimony and were reconfigured we also know that he suffered by his own statements from PSD as or PTSD, excuse me, as well as major anxiety events based on everything that was happening with Boeing. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he was under an incredible amount of stress. I think that, you know, that is obvious looking at the details here. But how relevant is it if someone tells their family or friends, hey, I'm worried if anything happens to me, it isn't suicide. How often do we have a statement like that before someone uh, unfortunately is found dead? Well, I don't know exact statistics, if you will, Natasha, but I will say that it does happen. And certainly most people who commit suicide, it is something that they keep well within themselves. They don't talk to their family and friends. And I can't think of one case where they came out and said something in advance. It just really doesn't happen that way. Sure. And so certainly family and friends are quite shocked and surprised. Yeah, and, and to that end, we know his former coworkers are saying the whole community is shaken up by this. Um, also, that they are skeptical about the cause of death being suicide. So Jennifer, if there are questions like this, is there a scenario where someone other than the Charleston Police Department could take over? Or what do you think needs to happen in this investigation given this new information? Well, I think they definitely need to look closely at things like fingerprints, DNA, surveillance camera. Did anybody approach him at that vehicle? All of that is going to be very important. Also, the GSR, his, in other words, is there gunshot residue on his hand 
that was used. There's going to be a lot of factors, and I think they're going to be able to prove without a doubt whether it was self-inflicted or whether it wasn't. It would seem in this case, you know, to, to your point, forensics are going to be incredibly important. Also, any cameras that were around this hotel parking lot where this took place. Would you say that in this case in particular, with the enormous amount of public interest we're seeing as well, investigators should be as transparent as possible with their findings? Oh, absolutely. It's so important because, of course, this is something that could take conspiracy theorists, you know, uh, can run away with a story like this. It's very important that they're transparent. I want to know what that note said in his hand. I want to know about the GSR. I want to know if that gun was found in his dominant hand and if there were any fingerprints or anyone else that approached that vehicle prior to him being found. And finally, Jennifer, in the investigation uh, after the Alaska Airlines door plug blew out mid-flight, Kelsey Kernstein also talking about this. Investigators now saying the surveillance footage of work being done on that 737 MAX jet has been overwritten. Any thoughts on this? Because, yes, it is standard practice that things get overwritten after a certain amount of time. But given what happened here, would you have expected Boeing to save that footage before it got deleted? I would have expected that. Thankfully, there will be some witnesses that hopefully can report on this. Natasha, this is so concerning. And as we know, stock prices has, have driven down, as well as United even saying they might shun the airline. So there's a lot of damage, if you will, that has already been done. And in my opinion, it's it should be done because they have got to change the practices at Boeing. Okay, Jennifer Koffendoffer, thank you so much for your time tonight. Have a great evening. Jennifer Koffendoffer, that's an interesting name, uh, <laughs> but not to uh, make light of the situation, but it seems a little odd. And, you know, the things that this woman brought up, was it his dominant hand? What did this note say? Security cameras in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn, because that's where he was staying. All of those things really do need to come into play because when you do look at this and it's funny that they always, always, I don't know when this will stop. When will it ever stop with the conspiracy theorist stuff? If you're just a person looking at it, he's dealing with a giant company. Then all of a sudden he goes to his hotel. He sits in his car and he never comes out of the car. What are you supposed to think? Like, does this have to be conspiratorial minded? In order to come to that conclusion that maybe he did like wh why i wish there was another phrase for someone who just felt like yeah yeah he probably did it himself yeah of course of course he did i don't know maybe that's a defeatist attitude i don't know but there, sh there should be something that we talk about uh, a phrase that we use for people who just run to that immediately because i don't know man i get the fact that he had the ptsd he had the anxiety but he said what he said. He made sure to say it. You know? And there's been many people. I, even James Lindsay in that, inter, in that uh, interview with Joe Rogan. He even made sure to say it. He brought it up jokingly. And he was like, hey, just want to say I'm joking. I would never do that. I feel fine. I love life. I've even made that reference. You can't all of a sudden push. If I was a cop... I guess, or a detective, whatever. I guess I wouldn't be on the payroll of you know being bought and paid for. But I would never take that lightly. I would be like, oh, he said that would never happen. Well, then we have to explore everything else then. He said it. He said it to a person. He said, believe me, I would never do this to myself. And now something's been done and it seems like he did it. We have to look into it. I don't, I don't understand why, if I was on the scene, and I found that out from his friend, I would be like, well, we're ruling out homicide. Homicide's been ruled out because the gentleman said himself that he wouldn't do that. So we're ruling it out. This would be like he had anxiety, but he was also going toe to toe with the company. Would you just all of a sudden just be like, I don't wanna do this anymore with this company. You could just walk away, you're retired, you're old. You're, you're older and you're retired. You could just walk away. You could just be like, forget it. Forget I said anything. Just, I'm done. I don't want to testify. And go home, and that's it. I don't know. We're going to hear a little bit more about the, uh, the entire scene of what happened when it comes to John. Here's another video. I know that he did not commit suicide. There's no way. 
First tonight, our investigative reporter Ann Emerson has new information in the death of Boeing whistleblower John Barnett. A close family friend of Barnett says he predicted he might wind up dead, that a story could surface that he killed himself. But he told her, don't believe it. Ann? Tessa, Barnett's family friend Jennifer said they had talked about this exact scenario playing out, but his words seemed like a premonition. He told her, don't ever believe it. I knew John because his mom and my mom are best friends. And so over the years, uh, get togethers, uh, birthdays, celebrations and, you know, whatnot, we've all got together and talked and, you know, uh, that's how we really know each other. And when Jennifer needed help one day, Barnett came by to see her. They talked about his upcoming depositions in Charleston. Jennifer knew he filed an extremely damaging complaint against Boeing. He says the aerospace giant retaliated against him when he blew the whistle on unsafe practices. For more than 30 years, Barnett was a quality manager. He'd recently retired and moved back to look after his mom in Louisiana. He wasn't concerned about safety because I asked him, I said, aren't you scared? And he said, and his voice and his, the way he we talk, uh, no, I ain't scared. Um, he said, but if anything happens to me, it's not suicide. You know, I know that he did not commit suicide. There's no way. He loved life too much. He loved his family too much. He loved his brothers too much to, to put them through what they're going through right now. And he basically told you not to believe it. Yeah, basically, yeah. Not true. He's got too much to do, likes breathing. <laughs> and he did. He had a lot of plans and things that he wanted to do. What do you think happened? I think somebody got in there and made, uh, you know, money can buy anything nowadays, it seems like. And there's a lot of evil in this world. I think uh, somebody uh, didn't like what he had to say and wanted to shut him up and uh, didn't want it to come back on uh, anyone, so that's why they made it look like a suicide. The last time she saw Barnett, it was at her father's funeral in late February. He was one of the pallbearers. Sometimes family and friends referred to him by his middle name, Mitch. I think everybody is in disbelief and can't believe it. And I don't. I told everybody that I don't care what they say. I know. Mitch didn't do that. And Whew, man, wild, absolutely wild. And I believe her. I believe her. I know there's some people that might have the thought process of why believe this woman. She's good friends with the guy, you know, talks to him often. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't take away the fact that sometimes mental health is just mental health and it doesn't matter what someone said and, you can't you can't take that out of the equation, but it just doesn't seem likely in this scenario for me. When I look at it, it just doesn't seem likely. I don't know. I, may, maybe maybe my my speedo's on too tight. Maybe that's what it is. But let's hear a little bit more about what happened with John. I believe this scene we're going to be hearing a little more from his own words and uh, just a little more into what actually happened with him. One of these should be actually talking about the crime scene. That's what I want to get you guys to. Police in Charleston, South Carolina, tell NBC News they are aware of the death of a former Boeing employee turned whistleblower. 62-year-old John Barnett found dead on Friday from what the coroner calls an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So this is my uh, retirement plaque. Barnett retired from Boeing in 2017 after working as a quality manager for more than 30 years. Since his departure, he has taken legal action against the company, claiming he was retaliated against for raising safety issues internally, issues that Boeing denied at the time. Back in 2019, Barnett sat down with Today, describing a haphazard safety culture at Boeing. From day one, it's just all been about schedule and hurry up and just get it done, push the planes out, we're behind schedule. You know, we don't have time to, to worry about issues that y'all bring up.
In 2017, the FAA released a review upholding many of Barnett's concerns. With regards to his sudden death, the company released a statement writing, We are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Production standards at Boeing are under intense scrutiny following a series of troubling incidents involving Boeing planes. The latest on Monday when a 787 from the South American airline Lantum apparently dropped abruptly mid-flight from Sydney to Auckland, injuring at least 50 passengers and crew members. The airline says it's unclear what caused the strong movement on the flight. NBC News has also confirmed the Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation into Boeing following the blowout door plug on a 787 MAX 9 in January. The NTSB determined the plane left the Boeing plant without critical bolts that hold the plug in place. A scathing new FAA audit also found Boeing failed to comply with its own quality control procedures. We're working with Boeing and uh, demanding that they come up with a very detailed plan within the next 90 days uh, to fix the quality issues that are out there. Tom, we've also learned new details about that FAA audit. What have you know? Yeah, that's right. So according to a slide presentation that was reviewed by the New York Times, Boeing failed 33 out of 89 FAA audits, 33 out of 89 failures over a six-week period. NBC News has not seen the slides uh, ourselves. Spirit Aerosystems, which makes the fuselage for the Boeing plane, also failed multiple audits. And in one case, auditors saw mechanics using a hotel key card to check a door seal. Other mechanics were seen applying liquid soap to a door seal as part of the fit-up process. NBC News told NBC, rather Boeing told NBC News this morning, quote, we continue to implement immediate changes and develop a comprehensive action plan to strengthen safety and quality and build the confidence of our customers and their passengers. And they have some work to do. Savannah. Absolutely. Tom. Wow. So interesting. It sounds like exactly what he was saying. Just a lot of uh, lacking quality, a lot of missing checks and balances going on. Sounds exactly like he, what he was saying. And he was right. But the problem is, if he was right, and he's testifying or going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and there's proof through all these like little cases, I mean, little I shouldn't even say little cases, a door coming off mid-flight is not a little case. If he was correct, and that could serve as proof, what ends up happening to them? What do they stand to lose in that situation? And what is it worth to them to not lose? I I don't know. You know, I can only can only speculate. We always assume the worst because it's a big company and we look at big companies as these soulless entities, which they are. They are not people. There's people inside of them, but there's a lot of people who just go bottom line. And there's even more people who are like, I'm not going to jail. I don't care. Hey, there's six of us in here. We're all going to get locked up. Hey, something needs to happen right now. I'm just saying there there are rooms where th that conversation has to be happening somewhere in Boeing. Anytime something like this happens. I don't know. Very, very interesting. Now, that wasn't the exact clip that I wanted to show you guys, but it did give some deeper insight into what John has been talking about what he was talking about this clip here is going to be a timeline of everything that happened before and after john's passing so let's get into that tell me what this sounds like to you guys and barnett was found dead in his truck in a holiday inn parking lot just off of savannah highway preliminary reports from the charleston county coroner's office are that his death appears to be from a self-inflicted wound However, that has not quelled the public attention over his death. For years, Barnett said publicly he was retaliated against the world by the world's largest aerospace company because he blew the whistle on unsafe practices. Our investigative reporter Ann Emerson has been talking to sources familiar with the story today. Ann, what are you learning about Barnett's death? 
Well, right now we're trying to nail down the timeline of John Burnett's death and the last time anyone saw or heard from him alive. Take a look at this timeline. The hotel staff told police John Barnett checked into room 511 at the hotel on March 2nd. Barnett's lawyer tells me he sat down for his deposition with Boeing's lawyers on Thursday the 7th. It was the start of a months long deposition process ahead of the June trial. March 8th, Barnett puts his complaints of a hostile work environment at Boeing on the record with his lawyers, but he grows tired of the questioning and leaves a little early. The idea was they would resume the next morning. His lawyer, Rob Turkowitz, tells me he spoke to his client for the last time around 6 p.m. Friday night. Saturday, March 9th, the weather is terrible. Huge storms inundate this area. 924 AM, a hotel staff member said they heard a pop near where Barnett's car was parked, but thought nothing of it. Turkowitz called the hotel when Barnett fails to show up for the deposition around 10 AM. Hotel staff locate Barnett in his car with a gun still in his hand, and what they say was a note on the passenger seat. We did not have any indication that he was under tremendous stress to the point where he would you know take his own life well right now we are waiting for the charleston police department to finish the investigation into barnett's death they are the lead agency and have yet to ask for any assistance part of the evidence will include the coroner's report and whether this was indeed a suicide coming up at seven we're going to take a closer look at what we know about <sighs> very very interesting so he was literally about to finish his testimony. Who knows what information was in that testimony? Only he really knows. I guess his lawyer probably was prepped on what he would be saying and talking about, which is why he took the case. Lawyer says he's not seeing any signs of stress. Goes into the parking lot after growing tired of the questions. Goes into his car and is found with a pistol and a note in his hand. No one knows what the note says. That doesn't sound like regular behavior but when people do this type of thing their behavior especially leading up to the event is never regular i don't know i don't know i know what it sounds like and i know what it looks like to all of you i will say in the previous clip that i just played interesting when the number 33 comes up i noticed that in a lot of different things if you watch a lot of news uh, things that happen in the world you'll notice that number comes up quite a bit and it was saying that Boeing failed 33 out of 89, and the guy made sure to repeat it. 33. I don't know. It. Just, if you know, if you know, you know that that number holds a lot of uh, weight in certain circles. Just saying. Now, let's get into DEI. Okay, that was something else that Rogan touched on. And rest in peace to John Barnett. Uh, I hope the work that you, or the things that you were trying to expose end up getting exposed i hope so you know hope it wasn't all in vain so let's get into this now there are some people two african-american gentlemen who are angry at elon musk because elon musk is slamming dei hiring especially in the aviation realm he thinks that that is not something that should be happening and if you don't understand what that means it means that they are hiring people sounds like affirmative action to me sounds like it's just dressed up in a new little uh, term they're hiring people less less on qualifications, not completely, not just no qualifications, but less on qualifications and more on the color of your skin and your gender. That's what's going on. That's fine at Burger King. That's fine at a bank, I guess. That's fine in a lot of other industries. But when it comes to aviation, like Joe was saying in that clip, when it comes to your plane, when it comes to your pilot, that is not something that you want in place. And that's what Elon Musk was trying to get across. But these gentlemen have something else to say when it comes to Elon Musk. But I will say they kind of prove his point as they're speaking. Being criticized for his views on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts at United Airlines and Boeing. He retweeted one user's post who said pilots who are graduates of historically black colleges and universities had lower IQs than the rest of the population, meaning white people. My next guest say the original post was totally flawed and there's no problem with black pilots in the cockpit.
Joining us on The Factor on Censored to talk about this tonight, Oliver Brown, a pilot, an attorney, and a proud product of the HBCU system, along with Todd Smith, who's also a product of the HBCU system. When you guys see people making comments like this and Elon Musk agreeing to it as a pilot, your thoughts on this, Oliver? Well, first of all, I, I saw the, the, the tweet that he I guess liked or commented on whatever, uh, those are made up facts and statistics. And that's like common, you know, red herring uh, type bull crap that people use in arguments. But um, um, it, it was it was offensive that Elon, who, who is in such a, a prominent position in the aviation industry, i.e. SpaceX and his, all the stuff that he's done, for him to even think that that is, is realistic, it, it, it was, it was uh, very disappointing. Uh, I would like to say, though, that um, IQ is not something that they're testing before you become an air airline pilot. What they're testing is your hand-eye coordination, your ability to critically think during uh, emergency situations, your ability to get along with others within a cockpit for long periods of time. Um, a lot of people always think pilots have to be great in math. I I'll tell you right now. A lot of pilots aren't good in math, and it doesn't take a lot of math in order to fly an airplane, okay? Yes, there's mathematics studies, but uh, some of it is, is it really takes more uh, bronze uh, than brains to get up there, you know? You have to have the balls to fly. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was really upset that he would try to, you know, uh, basically shame us and make us seem like we're we're not qualified to be in the cockpit there's plenty of african-american pilots that are that are more than qualified um and it, it's just it's, it's disheartening to see uh, a leader in aviation talk like this and and todd your perspective are you shocked that now elon musk is agreeing with something like this or he's showing us who he is showing us who he is i mean he's the reason why we need dei He's against DEI, but think about what that means. Diversity, who is against diversity? When I think about diversity, I'm not just talking about race and gender. As a businessman, I want people younger than me to tell me what's happening. I want people older than me to tell me what they're interested in. So that only helps you from a business perspective. Equity, equality, inclusion, who doesn't want to be included? But he's the reason why we need these efforts because if he was around black pilots, maybe, he, and, and or wannabe pilots, maybe he would, understand how ignorant his comments are well i, I want to say something about about these programs that have been put in place by the airlines i was part of a just a, a general internship program uh at continental express that got me in i remember uh a guy he's a captain over at, at united now brian shaw wonderful guy white man and he was looking for diversity in the cockpit and uh these programs though when you when you go through these special type programs it's a lengthy interview process there's a technical interview there's a review of all your flight training after you make it through that uh, after you've already had to already obtain all the licenses you're basically reapplying for your licenses again and then you have to go through rigorous airline training under part 21 which still has a washout rate and if you make it through that then you get to fly actual passengers and so elon musk is now uh, uh sowing uh, uh a a seed of doubt in the community that maybe when they see a black pilot up front, oh, he may not be smart enough. He's going to mm -hmm. cause an accident. In fact, that black pilot may have been in one of these DEI programs, as they call it now. We just called it back then, looking for black folk to put in seats. But <laughs> when they, but but when we came through, we had to go through an extremely rigorous process, and they didn't take just anyone. There was a lot of other black pilots, and they would still not include them, and they would only take the best of the best and put them in the cockpit because we knew there would come a day like this where someone would try to say, you're not qualified. And in fact, Corey Shepard over at United Airlines, he's now one of the youngest uh, designated pilot examiners appointed by the FAA to issue pilot's license, and he came from the HBCU. So you know what I'll tell Elon Musk? F your cars and F SpaceX. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's quite the best thing that one of the youngest guys is now qualifying pilots. That's something that someone older should do. And if all of the older people with all of the hours, if they're white, that's okay. But if you're putting the young guy in that position because he's young and because he's black, that's bad. He could be qualified, 
But there are certain things that after thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of hours that you learn on the job. And someone who's much older, maybe not so, not maybe not like Biden era, you know what I mean? Maybe they're like a spry Trump and they're like, all right, I know what's going on. Maybe that guy, right? He's learned quite a bit. He should probably be the one doing that. You know what I mean? And if, and if you're really looking for a diversity, find someone who's much older, more seasoned, and he's black. I don't know. But it sounds like it's getting a little out of control. This guy's toting. is like, well, this guy's super young, and he's only been in this position for four months, and he puts pilots in the sky. It's like, oh, it's terrible. That sounds terrible, buddy. Let's go back. Um, let's actually see the tweet, because I saw that they pulled the tweet up there. Uh, looks like one of the tweets is unavailable. Let's check this out. So what was the actual tweet? So someone said the average IQ pilots is about 120. And the figures I've seen for majority airline pilots range from 115 to 130. By contrast, the IQ grads from two of the United Airlines H. BCU partners is about 85 to 90 based on that we can't see the expanded one I couldn't find this tweet anywhere and then Elon Musk says it it will take an uh, <laughs> it will take an airplane crashing and killing hundreds of people for them to change this crazy policy well that's just true and listen listen I'm not saying it's true because I'm hateful I'm not self-hating. I'm not one of these self-hating black people because, you know, I, I don't understand how they just take it. Like, this gentleman just brought on two black people, you know, I guess because they brought up HBCUs. But it's not just black people. They're looking for young people. And that could be a young white guy. That could be a young white woman. It could just be a woman, period. It could be an Asian woman. They're just looking for any kind of diversity. Whoever wants to get in line and become a pilot, they're like, okay, we're just looking for diversity. Maybe you should look for passion. That's okay, too. You know? I don't know. I don't know. It seems very ridiculous. But the reason I say Elon's right about that is because there is a story like that. You're going to be hearing that in not this clip, but the next clip after, after with Tucker Carlson. Matt Walsh is going to expand on what's going on with this DEI hiring. And what he plays at the end of this clip is terrifying. Honestly, as someone that flies quite a bit. It's terrifying. Let's get into it. In December of 2022, a Boeing 777 operated by United Airlines took off from Hawaii in heavy rain. And about a minute into the flight, the aircraft plummeted towards the ocean. It came just 750 feet from hitting the water at high speed, which almost certainly would have killed all 280 people on board. In the end, the pilots saved the aircraft by just a matter of seconds. Now, for more than two months, no one heard about this incident. It was as if it had never happened. And by the time the mainstream news uh, reports began appearing in February, more than two months later, United assured the public that the FAA had been notified and that an investigation would be forthcoming. Watch. Alrighty, scary moments like this, though, for some passengers on a United flight out of Hawaii. Just moments after takeoff, the plane took a steep nosedive coming within 800 feet of the ocean's surface. Mm -hmm. This happened December 18th. Flight tracking data shows the Boeing 777 took off from Maui in a huge storm. You can see there climbed to 2,200 feet, then descended at 8,600 feet per minute towards the water. Uh, a passenger told CNN it felt like a roller coaster and that people were screaming on board. Oh my goodness. The pilots, yeah. Yeah, the pilots recovered from the nosedive and then safely made the trip to San Francisco. Wow. United says a formal report was filed with the FAA. The pilots then received additional training. The whole incident lasted around 45 seconds. That's a long flight after something like that happens on takeout, takeoff. Now, notice how there, there's not much curiosity from the news anchor there about why this incident took so long for the airline to disclose to the public is the kind of thing that you'd like to think we'd hear about right, right away. And there's also not much of an explanation about what happened exactly. It's implied that the pilots may have made a mistake because they're getting more training. But what mistake did they make exactly? Well, late last year, we got something of an official answer. It turns out that according to the NTSB, the captain called for the flaps to be retracted to the five-degree setting, which is a normal setting for takeoff. But the first officer thought the captain had called for a 15-degree setting, so he selected that one, which was the wrong one. And that misunderstanding 
caused a major problem because the plane was going far too fast for that flap setting. To avoid damaging the plane, the captain started to slow the aircraft while he tried to diagnose the problem. Instead of realizing his mistake, the first officer suggested that maybe the instruments were malfunctioning and the two pilots continued to kind of troubleshoot the problem. In the process, they became disoriented as the plane quickly lost altitude. Uh, the pilot's confusion continued until the plane blared an alarm telling them that they were about to die if they didn't apply maximum power and pull up, and they did. And, uh, and fortunately, nobody was harmed. Incredibly, both pilots of the flight are still employed by United Airlines, we're told. They nearly killed everybody on board through their incompetence, but that's not disqualifying, apparently. Beyond some basic information about their flying experience, we still don't know much about those two pilots. For example, we know that the first officer has a total of 5,300 hours of flying experience, which is respectable for his position. But at the time of the incident, he only had 120 hours in the Boeing 777. And according to a report by Tucker Carlson last year, which cited an anonymous source at United shortly after this near catastrophe took place, this first officer was a new hire at the airline. Could that lack of experience have played a role? And more to the point, could either of the pilots' identities have played a role in their hiring or the airline's refusal to terminate them after they almost steered a passenger jet into the ocean. We don't know. We're not allowed to know because the federal government and the airlines don't want us to know any more information about the identity of these pilots or any of their pilots who are involved in near disasters or anything else about what actually happened. There is an ongoing information blackout about these kinds of events, and it's, it's deliberate. But in their various public statements and press releases, United Airlines has made it very clear that they are mainly interested in hiring pilots on the basis of skin color and gender rather than competence. In fact, they participated in a Vice documentary back in 2022, um, United did, about their DEI initiatives. Uh, watch. So we are in a plane right now. I'm about to take off with a student from United's new Aviate Academy. A bit nervous, but let's do this. Purefoy is training to become a pilot with United Airlines, which became the first major airline to launch its own flight school at the beginning of this year. But United is making another push. It said half of its recruits are going to be women or people of color, a pretty ambitious goal for airline pilots who are 93% white and 95% male. Black women make up less than 1% of the pilot industry. I have a confession, guys. I have never Watch seen look. a black woman fly a plane. What made you want to become a pilot? So I was a flight attendant for three years on a major U.S. airline, and I absolutely loved it. So, so, uh, flight attendant. And listen, you got to be very smart to be a flight attendant. You have to be able to deal with different people at different stress levels in a very confined space, keep people calm, keep people entertained, uh, in a sense, communicate with the captain and, uh, you know, uh, take what he says and communicate it to the people in the plane. Uh, you have to deal with your coworkers. There's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do. So it's not like, you know, they're just airheads or something, but the fact that she was a flight attendant is just showing you what they're doing in terms of DEI it has nothing to do with the black person or woman. It's the fact that in the name, and I've said this so many times, in the name of inclusivity, these companies, people, organizations are willing to destroy society. They're willing to destroy companies, organizations, the way things work. They're willing to wreck lives all in the name of inclusion it's it's very odd and and have a stiff intolerance towards <laughs> a stiff intolerance to anyone who is not tolerant of what they say or what they want it's it's very it's very interesting how it all works but again this has nothing to do with a being a black woman or anything it's the fact that they're willing to fast track in the name of diversity they're fast tracking this type of stuff and that's what it seems like now i can't link what John Barnett was talking about in terms of things not being checked out properly and, and everything he was talking about. I can't link that to DEI. But after learning so much about this, it does, it, it could be, a, there could be a correlation there. 
Maybe it's not the slow erosion. Maybe it is. I'm not sure, but something's going on where, you know, the pilots are just not having that much experience and you're racist if you think that they should be older and experienced. And if older experienced people are white, that's a problem. And it should be younger people that who get the roles, even though they don't have the same experience as somebody who's more qualified. And you're not allowed to say that that person there because of the color of their skin, you can't say that they're more qualified and you're not allowed. To, it's just... It's so it's so silly in a domain where we should not be caring about someone's color, their, their 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 gender, their age. We shouldn't be caring about that at all. That is becoming their focus. And that's terrifying. And if they're doing it, if they're willing to do it with pilots, are they also willing to do it with people who are building the planes, putting the doors on, doing the checks? I don't know. John Barnett was a very old white man and he had a lot of experience and he was able to call it the way he saw it and it seems like he was right. Maybe that's needed in the pilot realm as well. Maybe they didn't like John because he didn't fit the new DEI and also he had a lot of bad things to say about Boeing. I have no idea, but it seems like something odd's going on. Now, here's a little example of DEI run amok. Tucker Carlson, as Matt Walsh even brought up, did cover this about a year ago, and this is what he found. Conrad Aska was born in 1974 in the tiny Caribbean nation of Antigua, and by every account, he was an outstanding person. Conrad was the leader of the family, said his brother. We all looked up to him. Aska was certainly a man of deep religious faith, and we know that because his final words in the second before his death were, quote, Lord, you now have my soul. Imagine saying that as your final sentence. But his death is a scandal. The reason he died is a scandal, and many in the aviation industry know about it, but it is never mentioned in public. So we thought we would tell you because there are lessons in his death for all of us who travel commercially. In February of 2019, Asco was the first officer piloting an Amazon Prime cargo jet for a contractor called Atlas Air. They were flying a Boeing 767. And as, it, as it approached Houston Airport, Aska assumed full control of the plane. Seconds later, while attempting to apply the speed brakes to land, Aska accidentally pressed a switch that put the plane into go-around mode. And that gave the plane an unexpected jolt of thrust. In response to this unexpected jolt, Aska panicked. Instead of checking his instruments to figure out what was going on, he pushed down hard on the control yoke. He pushed as hard as he could. And then the plane nosedived through the clouds and right into the water. The plane was obliterated on impact. It killed him, his co-pilot, and another pilot who was just hitching a ride. So it was obvious from those facts alone that Conrad Aska, decent man though he was, should not have been in control of an airplane. And his personnel records confirm that strongly. Before he started flying 767s for Amazon and Atlas Air, he had been a pilot for seven different airlines, including Mesa Airlines. Several instructors at Mesa reported that Aska was often overwhelmed in the cockpit, as he was on the day he died. One pilot later told the NTSB that in emergencies, Aska, quote, became extremely anxious and would start pushing a lot of buttons without thinking about what he was pushing just to be doing something. To be clear, for a pilot, that can be deadly, and it was. Atlas Air says it was not aware of any of this when it hired Aska. But once he arrived at Atlas Air, Aska was so deficient in the simulator that all pilots have to train on that the company had to restart simulator training just for him. All of his other classmates had graduated. Predictably, in its final report into the Atlas Air crash, the NTSB cited as a cause of the deadly crash the quote, systemic deficiencies in the aviation industry's selection and performance measurement practices, which failed to address the first officer's aptitude-related deficiencies and maladaptive stress response. By the way, those are things that all airlines and the military screen for and have since aviation began. And ask his family, who lost their son and husband and brother, knew that. And so they have gone on to file several lawsuits against Atlas Air and Amazon for gross negligence, specifically for putting this man in the cockpit despite his obvious inability to fly an airplane. 
So why was he flying an airplane? Well, in his specific case, we do not have a definitive answer, but it seems pretty obvious. Airlines like Atlas Air, in fact, all the airlines, are doing their best to hire and retrain pilots on the basis of irrelevant criteria like their appearance. And your appearance to restate has nothing to do with your ability to fly an airplane or perform heart surgery or do anything. It's immaterial. But on their websites, both Amazon and Atlas Air explain that, quote, diversity is paramount in everything they do. Here's from the Atlas Air website, quote, we leverage diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, as a business strategy and driver of innovation. We are guided by DEI philosophy. Oh, yes, well, apparently you are. And look at the results. Amazon, of course, says the same thing. This is not an outlier. This is not just happening at Atlas Air. This is happening at every major carrier in the United States. Safety concerns ignored in favor of something called equity. Hiring by appearance, not by ability. This is insane. And in this case, it killed three people. United Airlines has promised that 50% of their new trainees will be, quote, women and minorities. Right. Not the best pilots, but people who look a certain way. Well, as we told you, in December, a United Boeing 777 bound for San Francisco came within seconds of hitting the ocean. It just dropped out of the sky. And the pilots, who apparently were not properly trained or hired for the wrong reasons on the basis of irrelevant criteria, were sent back to training. Thankfully, the hundreds of people on that plane survived. But this kind of thing is happening across the industry. Talk to anyone who works there. Talk to any working pilot right now. The airlines are in a mad scramble to meet equity targets, meaning they are pushing safety aside in favor of ideology. Wow. Wow. So I guess, I guess Elon was actually wrong. He said it's going to take somebody dying in order for this to stop happening and apparently that's just not true so there have been these brushes with death there have been pilots who have completely obliterated planes and they're still pursuing it to this day like i said tucker carlson filmed that a year ago it was one year ago where he was talking about this and then we have john john barnett saying what he was saying about the quality and now he's gone and they're still pushing forward with this. <sighs> it's very interesting. Now, the last clip I have is a doozy. This is a former DEI trainer who is talking about how flawed DEI is, how it does not help the people that it puts in these positions. I think we kind of understand that already by just hearing Tucker's story about the pilot who completely just smashed into the water took a bunch of lives with him. I think you can see that, and he didn't do it on purpose, he just wasn't experienced enough. But he fit the profile. Same way, the same way a crooked cop goes, you fit the description. That's what they did. They said, you fit the description. Get in this plane. It's not good. It's really, really not good. So, let's get into this last video. About DEI training, it's supposed to make us aware of our unconscious prejudice. But a former DEI trainer, rhetoric professor Eric Smith, says today's DEI training does more harm than good. Here's my entire interview with Smith. People do need to be woken up. Yeah, and that was the point, you know, diversity walk or something like that when somebody says uh, how many people grew up in a single parent household and things like that. If you were encouraged to attend college by your parents and your family members, take one step forward. The diversity or privilege walk is supposed to teach us how much more or less privilege we have. If you grew up in a household with two parents, step forward. And at the end of it, you know, the most privileged people are in front and the least privileged people are in back. I did that, but it wasn't to guilt anybody. It wasn't to uh, say, you know, you need to check your privilege. It was to say, look at the world here. Look at what's going on. Uh, we should be aware of these things. Why not tell people to check their privilege? Some of us have privilege. Yes, but some of us are accomplished, and that's being called privilege. And I, I think that's unfair. It's one thing to be born on third base and act like you hit a triple. It's another thing to be born on first base and still second, right? 
And again, third, you know, th that's an accomplishment. And that's frowned upon now? Well, it's frowned upon by people who find it strategic to frown upon it, yes. If you can keep this race thing going, then you will always have a business in getting rid of racism. Even Ibram X. Kendi proposed a branch of government, right, regarding anti-racism. And what do you need to justify that? You need racism. It's in his best interest to perpetuate racism, you know, in, in order to uh, maintain a career. Then there are people who are like, uh, wow, well, this is a, you know, billion dollar industry. I'm going to get in on this. You know, I do my trainings and things like that and accuse people of, of racism just to keep it perpetuated, right? To keep it going so that it never goes away, so that I keep making my money. Or It or is a multi-billion dollar industry. Yes, it now. is. Every big company. Yeah. They feel they have to. Right, and there it is. They feel like they have to. They have to say something. They have to signal to the world that they're doing something. Whether that something is effective or not is secondary. Is it effective? It doesn't seem to be effective, no. Uh, in fact, it seems to be doing worse. It seems to be making people uh, less likely to interact with people who are unlike them, you know, because it's like a minefield now. Less likely to interact? Yes, yes, yes. After a training where you hear things about microaggressions, right, microaggressions, um, if you ask somebody what they do for a living, somehow that's racist, right? If you learn that, then why would you take a chance? I better not talk to Eric because I might say something wrong. Precisely. Any other ideas about this not working? Well, if you compel people, you know, to uh, go to certain things just out of pure resentment, they may, you know, uh, back away and, and, and rebel. I, I saw that myself even when I was doing uh, diversity training that wasn't especially woke. All this money is spent, all these courses, all this time. Why doesn't it get the results they want? Well, it might be getting the results they want. Depends on who you mean by they. Why doesn't it bring racial harmony to the office? Because diversity, equity, and inclusion, those words don't mean what most people think they mean. Diversity is diversity of bodies, of skin color, um, uh, ethnicity, not of thought. You know, you can have many different bodies, but they have to be, you know, basically on the same page ideologically. That page is often something akin to uh, critical social justice. Inclusion means, well, you can't make people uncomfortable. And in a world of microaggressions, that's easy to do. So now inclusion means I'm going to silence myself and not talk to the black people, right? Um, and equity, as uh, most people know, um, does not mean equality. It means equality of outcome, right? Um, we have to make sure everybody ends up in the same place, no matter how they got there, which is why we get rid of aptitude tests, um, which is why uh, we get rid of AP classes, which is why we have equitable math and things like that. That's equity. Because there were too many Asians and whites in the AP class. Apparently, or not enough black people. And, and that's interesting. Um, it's easy to say people are doing this out of resentment, right? But some people may be doing this out of love. You know, is it hate for white people or love for black people? You know, and um, what's motivating them? Now, yes, they're still misguided, um, but they see this as, well, the ends justify the means, and the, and the ends are racial equality and, and black dignity, so I'm going to do what I have to do. But it's real. We whites have most of the power. Most of the money, we hold most of the high positions. Some of that is genuine achievement. Some is racism. Yeah. So what do you do? You give other people the opportunity to acquire those things themselves. You, you know, uh, get them into a, a good um, school. You, you, you bring back institutions like churches and and um, other after-school programs. You, you teach them what it means to be an entrepreneur in this world. It's not just about um, victimhood. It's not just about white oppressors. You know, there's some of that going on, but there's also some agency that we have, you know, to get to where we want to go. And if we keep saying, well, there's nothing we can do, we can't win because of the white oppressor, then what is that going to do to an entire group of people? Nothing good. Man. I like that guy a lot. Again, his name is Eric Smith, PhD, very smart man. 
I hope he's doing more in this space. I hope he's talking about this more. He could easily have his own channel and start doing things. I'm going to look into that. I'll let you guys know. But what he said at the end, I've said that so many times. When you go into this mindset of you are oppressed and you're basically saying there should be white people. Like if you're a black person, if you're a woman, maybe it's to men. You're saying that they should give you a hand up. They should be the ones picking you up and helping you out. Whereas if you take that away and you say, I'm not a victim, I'm not oppressed, there are things that I just need to change. There are things that I just need to enhance and I can take the world. I can take on the world. I can do anything. You give yourself all the power. The second you become a victim, you become powerless. And I think in some way that is how they want people to be, whether it's the black community or women or just men in general, just I think that's what they want. That's why victimhood is so praised nowadays because the victims are powerless and they celebrate being powerless. That's exactly where you want a population to be, in my opinion. Now, that's for another episode, but honestly, the things that he said in terms of the companies trying to signal to the world, that's exactly what this is. The whole inclusion, they're trying to signal to the world little deeper they're trying to signal to blackrock again we go back to what larry fink said you got to force behavior they're signaling to blackrock hey we've done the thing so on our third quarter when we ask for that loan so we can expand x department or expand into this region of the world you're gonna help us right we need six billion dollars can we can we get that they're gonna say yes you've done what we've asked you to do we force this behavior you're now doing it you can be helped financially you will be impacted positively. It's, it's again, ESG for companies is their social credit system. That's exactly what it is. So they have to build up social cred. So they got to do the Bud Light thing and the Doritos thing and the Target thing. Those companies actually have to do that. And elite, it's not it's not excusing it at all. It's terrible to do. You should stand up and just say no and just take that low score and just deal with it. Just move through the ranks. I'm sure all Trump's companies are just like bah, low. Elon Musk's company dropped heavily because of what he's done. He doesn't get that funding. You know, if he ever needs it even, I, I don't know that he ever will truly need it. But I don't know. I You can't tell a person what to do in terms of their money because that impacts their family. But you would think that's something where you should just kind of take the hit because they're forcing you to do things. Like think of what Boeing's going through right now. Think if this happens again, just 30 times, how crazy will that look? If you hear about a plane crash once, you're just like, whew, wow. If you heard about it another 30 times, just from one company and it's happening just because they keep on putting people who are not qualified in positions where qualified people should be. And they just said, well, you know, it was an old stuffy white guy and we couldn't have that. So we got this cool guy. His name's Kamal. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but the plane crash, what happened? Could you just brought Ned along with Kamal and maybe Ned can just be his mentor for a while, for years <laughs> until he's really qualified, till he's really, till he really has his legs under him? Like, what's wrong with that? I thought, I thought this whole thing was the oppressor reaching down and helping people up. What happened to that? It's interesting. It's interesting as you start digging into the mindset, this ideology, seeing how flawed it is. Another thing that he said, you're less likely to interact. I have seen that just in my younger days, working in factory to factory, older people always would try to stay, not, not every single time, but majority of the time, they would try and stay away from the younger people because they knew the younger people were just softer. They just had a different attitude. They didn't want to work as hard. They were more likely to complain about things. So they would just not interact. They would just be like, I'm just going to stay over here and do what I do. So I can completely see that. I, I have that. I've gone through that, whether it's women or maybe it's somebody who I'm not sure of their... My wife actually went through that, where she wasn't sure of someone's gender and she messed up my wife's just a regular lady you know and she messed up and called someone a he that wanted to be called a she and then that person's like i'm not sure if i'm safe here and it was a whole thing 
And my wife has the greatest intentions when she's working alongside people. But after that, she was like, oh, she started dreading when that person would come in. It wasn't someone that they worked for, it was a customer, but she, she started dreading. She'd be like, oh God, I have to deal with this person again. Hopefully I don't mess up and they say that I'm an unsafe person. So that's definitely true. And then when he said it's diversity in body, not in thought, I think we all know about that. 100% it's diversity in, uh, in, in body, in color, all of those things, but not in thought. Everybody has to have the same thought process. That's how, that's how it goes. We all know that. The woke culture, that's exactly how it goes. And the second you break away from it, even slightest, that's it. You're gone. And then the thing that stood out to me when he was talking about inclusion means that you're going to be silent. That, that I've never heard before, but it does make a lot of sense. And again, look at your life. Look at your life and see where it's happening. All these things that we're talking about, right? See if you can see it. See it if you, if you see it in your workplace, if you've gone through it. And then the thing that he said, is it hate for white people that's making you do this? Like these DEI trainers? Or is it love for black people? Like, which is it? It could be powered by love. And that's what we assume in all of these cases. But it also could be powered by hate. That's an interesting thought process. And I think we're starting to see that more as we see the compilations of people saying it's not okay to be white and ridiculing white people. And, you know, you know, you see it all the time, you know, and of course, it doesn't just happen to white people, it happens to black people, it happens to everybody. But uh, interesting what's going on now again. R.I.P. to Josh Bar or John Barnett. Sorry, John Barnett. Condolences to his family. Uh, Rogan was a little flippant when he said, um, you know, maybe he just realized. It. Rogan was joking, of course, but I don't think that's what happened to the man. I don't think he thought he did the wrong thing and then did what he did. I think something else happened. And I don't know what, but I think they should be looking into every single possible avenue other than he did it himself. That's what I think. Anyways, guys, like, subscribe, share. And other than that, I'm out.